So now we can talk about factors that affect enzymatic activity. Uh, so that includes environmental conditions, right? Temperature and pH are going to uh, alter enzymes and, and speed up or slow down chemical reactions. The concentration of enzyme and substrate will also affect the rate of chemical reactions. And here it's interesting to think about if a cell wanted to control the rate of its chemical reactions, would it be able to increase or decrease the concentration of its enzymes inside the cell? Would it be able to increase or decrease the concentration of substrate inside the cell? And if so, how would it do it? something to think about. Uh, finally, we'll look at a regulatory mechanisms. So the cell or the organisms have all sorts of inhibitors and activators that can either prevent or allow chemical reactions to take place. So it's a regulatory mechanism in the sense that the cell then can decide if it's able to control also the concentration of its inhibitors and activators, uh, which chemical reactions will occur. Now, inhibitors and activators are also found outside of cells, uh, right, in the environment. Or, uh, for example, if we buy some drugs, uh, they might act as uh, regulators of chemical reactions. Or poisons, for example, typically act as inhibitors of chemical reactions. So if we look at temperature first, here we have a graph showing that as temperature increases, the enzymatic activity will increase uh, up to a certain point. And here we're looking at the curve for humans. And so if we were to see what, where the optimum is, it's around 37 degrees. Why would that be interesting, no? Um, and we see that the, the, uh, as the temperature increases up to that point, the uh, chemical reactions or the enzymatic activity is favored. But then as the temperature increases further, at some point, the enzymatic activity decreases quite a bit. So why is that? Well, first think about the increase. Why is it that as we increase temperatures, the enzymes will carry out, carry out more chemical reactions? Well, that's just in general, when you increase temperature, you're going to have more collisions between the molecules. Okay, so more collisions makes it more likely that some of those collisions, which might involve enzyme and substrate, uh, will occur. And uh, you also have more forceful collisions. So. So that's in general with an increase in temperature, how it increases the reaction rate, but that's also going to hold if enzymes are present, right? Because you know more collisions, there's more opportunities for the enzyme to bind to the substrates. That's for the increase. But what about the decrease? And here maybe we can get a little bit of help from our next, the following image below and the question that uh, goes with it. What bonds would break due to increased molecular vibration, right? Increased kinetic energy due to uh, higher temperature. Well, what are those bonds that relatively easily can break? So typically the hydrogen bonds would break easily with increased temperature. And now if the hydrogen bonds break, that's going to cause the molecule to change shape. Because those hydrogen bonds, I mean, any molecule, but we're looking here at the, as an enzyme, right? So it's going to cause the enzyme to change shape. Those hydrogen bonds are broken. And those are some of those bonds we're holding the whole molecule in three dimensions together. So now the, pro, the enzyme unravels and becomes denatured, right? And if we have um, denaturation, we have loss of structure and therefore loss of function, right? Uh, so we have denaturation of the enzyme. So we can no longer interact with the substrates and so no longer carry its functions. 
okay? So in humans, the optimal temperature is 37. Now, through the process of evolution by natural selection, other species uh, that have evolved in different environment uh, now have enzymes that uh, are adapted to those particular conditions, right? Uh, for example, if we take those bacteria here that live in very hot environments, their enzymes would not denature, not even at 90 degrees or 95 degrees. Okay, maybe eventually they will at high, even higher temperatures. Uh, but those enzymes uh, or you know, the, the organisms have evolved the production of enzymes that are very resistant to, to those temperatures. And so they will not change shape. It's interesting that we can now use those uh, enzymes found in, uh, in the uh, thermophilic bacteria. I think I'll write that here, thermophilic bacteria. Philic, it's to love and thermo means heat. So our temperature, so tem thermophilic prokaryotes. So we can obtain those enzymes. And we can use them in various processes of interest, such as when we do PCR reactions, we're using TAC polymerases from uh, Thermos aquaticus, which is a, a thermophilic bacteria. Uh, other examples of adaptations uh, in fish that live in cold, very cold environments, like in very cold waters of the Antarctic. Um, have enzymes that are functional at much lower temperatures. So interestingly, we can use uh, those enzymes in laundry products so we can wash our clothes at a low temperature. Interesting. So that's the evolutionary process, right? Through natural selection. Um, now, also interesting to consider is that in any organism, not all enzymes or not all proteins will denature at the same temperature. So some proteins are more or less resistant to denaturation in any organism um, and enzymes, including enzymes. And so the question here is, how will that alter uh, the cells, in particular with respect to chemical reactions taking place inside the cell? Uh, and so think of the enzymes as little workers in a factory. And so now you can think if we increase temperature, some workers will stop, you know, they're, they're just too tired, it's too hot. So they stop working while others can keep going on, okay, at different uh, stations in the, in the factory. But how is it going to affect uh, the chemical reactions overall and the coordination of those chemical reactions? Right, interesting to think about. Okay, another example uh, of a factor affecting enzymatic activity, pH, right, pH values. So changes in pH will alter the structure of enzymes. So just like in temperature, if you increase or decrease uh, too much your pH, some hydrogen and ionic bonds will be formed or broken. Uh, and that will result in protein denaturation. So we get, we get the same problem as with temperature here. Now, interestingly, cells have the ability to uh, compartmentalize or sequester uh, different chemical reactions in their organelles. And so they can even have different pH in their various organelles so that different types of reactions can take place. So for example, at acidic pH, uh, which favors breakdown of molecules, for example, in the lysosome, which has a lower pH than the rest of the cell, well, we're able to break down some, uh, some uh, molecules there, right? And, and so how do we maintain those different pH values in the different organelles? Um, we can do that through proton pumps. Remember that pH is a measure of the concentration of H plus, right? Just to keep that in mind. Uh, and so if we can transport those H pluses in or out of the organelles, 
then we can maintain a pH uh, that is different from the outside. Okay, so we have those proton pumps, which are going to require energy, but we'll be able to push uh, hydrogen ions ag against their uh, concentration gradient. Um, for example, it can push or pull the hydrogen ions into a lysosome. So uh, let me show you a little video of that. Although we generally think of the movement of protons across the membrane as a mechanism for driving the synthesis of ATP in chemiosmosis, protons can also be actively transported across a membrane at the expense of ATP. For example, a proton pump can be used to maintain a 100-fold gradient between the inside of a lysosome and the cytoplasm of the cell. The transmembrane protein that acts as a proton pump binds a proton on the inside of the cell membrane while it is in conformation A. The energy from ATP then drives the transport of the proton to the outside of the cell through the formation of conformation B. Release of the proton on the outside of the cell results in the protein reassuming conformation A, in which the next proton can attach on the inside of the cell and be transported. Okay, so that's how we maintain those um, pH gradients in between the different organelles inside a cell. Now, uh, on that image, so for your information here, you see that uh, we have two different enzymes which are active or have optimal pH values for their activity. Trypsin, which is found in the small intestine, and pepsin, which is found in the stomach. So you may be new in the stomach, the pH is much lower uh, there compared to the small intestine. So evolution has occurred such that uh, we have those enzymes that are um, optimal at different pH values, okay? Now it's interesting with respect to the digestive tube because we're uh, secreting those substances into the tube. So that brings me to a kind of a side question here. Are trypsin and pepsin endoenzymes or exoenzymes? So something to think about, also mentioned in your lab activity, I believe. So now looking at other factors affecting enzyme activity, so we can consider the concentration of substrate as well as the concentration of enzyme. So here we have a, an a graph showing the change in substrate concentration and its effect on the reaction rate, how fast the chemical reactions are occurring. So what we see, and this is assuming that everything else remains constant, right? We're not changing the concentration of the enzyme or the pH or temperature. So as if we have more substrate in the environment of the cell, we see that the rate of chemical reaction will increase uh, at first, but eventually even adding more substrate, the rate of chemical reaction will reach a maximum rate at which it can no longer increase, okay? Even if you add more and more substrate. So the question is why? And to answer that question, uh, I'd like you to think as we have been discussing before of the cell as a biochemical factory, and of the enzymes as workers in the factory, okay? So take a few seconds to think about this. We're adding substrate, so we're giving more components, the, the components needed to build the devices that those workers are building. So here are the components, right? So we're giving them more, okay? And at first, this has an effect. We're able to build more devices, but eventually providing more and more and more components uh, does not allow the factory to build more devices or the workers. So why is that? So think about it. And maybe you have the answer already, okay? But could discuss that some other time as well. Now, 
if we change the concentration of enzyme uh, instead and keep everything else constant, and here in this example, we're assuming a large excess of substrate. We see that by increasing the enzyme concentration, the reaction rate uh, will increase. Okay, more chemical reactions will occur. And this, there's no maximum, it just keeps increasing. Okay, why is that? And again, to answer this question, think of the enzymes as the workers in the factory. And now we're not adding more components. We have plenty of components. We're assuming a large excess of substrate. So it's not the components we're adding. We're adding more workers, okay? And as we add more workers and more workers and more workers, well, those workers can work, right? And they can build the devices so more devices will be built if we have more workers, okay? Again, assuming that our uh, substrate are in plenty supply, right, in excess. <clears throat> we can also discuss what we call inhibitors and activators, which are going to regulate the rate of chemical reactions or regulate the enzyme activity, okay? So the inhibitors would bind to enzymes and prevent completion of chemical reaction. And we'll look at the activators after. So there's two um, possible types, if you'd like, of uh, inhibitors. We have the competitive inhibitors. And so the competitive inhibitors, uh, so here we have the normal reaction with our substrate, right, which has a matching shape to the active site of the enzyme. The competitive inhibitor will bind to the active site of the enzyme, preventing the substrate from binding and therefore preventing the chemical reactions from taking place. Okay, so that should be relatively straightforward, I think. Now, the non-competitive inhibitor, uh, this one does not bind to the active site, instead it binds somewhere else. Okay, so somewhere else on the enzyme. And what it does, it causes, oh, by the way, when we say that it binds somewhere else, we say it's an allosteric site, meaning uh, elsewhere. Um, so when that non-competitive inhibitor binds, to uh, the enzyme, the enzyme will change its shape slightly, including the active site. So you can see that if you compare, uh, let me use a different color, this is already colored. So, so if we compare here the active site with this active site here, we see that it's not the same shape, okay? Or it's slightly modified. And because it's slightly modified, the substrate will not be able to bind. So maybe it will bind less well, or maybe it won't be able to bind at all. Uh, and that would e either decrease or prevent the chemical reactions from taking place. We have some examples here. So here we have an example of competitive inhibition where we have a virus, a influenza virus, that, uh, so normally those viruses, they have a bunch of proteins on their surface. Uh, and so some of those proteins might be enzymes, like in the case of the influenza virus, we have an enzyme called neuraminidase. Uh, and that enzyme is important because it allows the virus to detach from a cell, uh, in this case, the outside surface of a cell, to detach from it and then uh, go on and move to infect a different cell, okay? Or to infect another cell. These are probably viruses that were produced inside the cell and now they came out. But in order to then infect other cells, they need to detach from their host cell. So that's the role of the neuraminidase enzyme. So it's essential for uh, continuing the infection. Now, uh, a drug has been one, and actually several drugs have been devised uh, that will uh, block the neuraminidase, therefore preventing uh, the virus from being detached from its host cell. And therefore the virus will stay there and just not go on and infect other cells. So that's going to decrease the, the effect of the infection, right? 
uh, prevents transmission of the virus to other cells. So that drug is called Relenza. There's some other drugs that would do something similar. Okay, so that would be a, an example of competitive inhibition, because as you can see, uh, sorry, the um, the drug uh, Relenza binds to uh, this that site where otherwise a the hemagglutinin would would bind to. Okay. Um, Another example, in this case, it's a non-competitive inhibitor. Uh, so in this uh, process, so it's a series of, uh, of events here taking place within the cell membrane and one, two, three, four, these are like enzyme complexes. Uh, and we have a drug called cyanide, you might have heard of, which binds to this uh, cytochrome C complex here, number four, uh, and it prevents its action. Okay, so it's non-competitive because it doesn't bind on the active site, it binds somewhere else, but it changes the shape of the enzyme uh, in such a way that the enzyme is no longer functional. All right. Now that's going to be problematic because this, this is called the electron transport chain. And this is essential in the production of ATP. So when we block one of the steps, we can no longer make ATP. And if we can no longer make ATP, our cells will not survive very long, right? And the individual might not survive very long either, depending on the concentration of cyanide. So uh, if you eat some apple seeds, you're going to get a little bit of cyanide. So you're going to prevent a little bit of your ATP from being produced, but uh, don't be too worried. A couple of seeds won't make a huge difference. Uh, if you decide to go and eat more seeds, uh, you need about 200 seeds, uh, to, uh, to have enough cyanide that uh, could become a fatal event. Okay, so obviously not something to try at home, uh, but it's just interesting to know that cyanide is present in uh, those seeds of the apples. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you a short video on, uh, on this, uh, in particular, this, these events here at the electron transport chain. Inside our cells, organelles called mitochondria convert the energy stored in food to a form that the cell can use. A group of proteins on the mitochondrion's membrane form the electron transport chain. Carrier molecules donate electrons from food to the chain. As the electrons flow, the chain pumps protons out of the membrane. These protons move back across the membrane through the protein ATP synthase, causing it to spin and make the cell's energy source, ATP. When cyanide is ingested or inhaled, it inhibits the protein cytochrome C oxidase. This backs up the whole chain and ATP production stops. Within minutes, cell death can occur. Now, inhibitors can bind to enzymes in a way that is reversible. That is, uh, they can bind and unbind. So the, the bonds uh, are quite weak. So in this example here, we see that it's a competitive inhibitor binding to the active site. Uh, while the substrate could also bind to the active site when the inhibitor is not present. Uh, but what we see is that we have um, a reversible reaction uh, shown here by those two arrows uh, going in the opposite direction. So the inhibitor can bind and unbind, okay? So it's in competition with the substrate for the active site. And as soon as the inhibitor unbinds, then the enzyme is able to uh, bind to the substrate. But there's another possibility that is irreversible inhibition. And this is when a, uh, an inhibitor will bind to an enzyme in, um, in a stronger way. So forming, for example, covalent bonds uh, 
in a way that is permanent, that is, um, it's irreversible. So here we have the example of mercury binding to uh, the enzyme, uh, not at the active site, but somewhere else. But as you can see, as mercury binds to that enzyme, it forms some covalent bonds, resulting in a change in shape of that enzyme. And that change in shape is permanent. So now the enzyme is useless. It will never be able to carry a chemical reaction again. All right. Here we have another example. Uh, the first example was allosteric, right? Not at the active site. And this here is another example, but in this case at the active site. Um, so in this situation, so we have acetylcholinesterase, which is an enzyme that breaks down some neurotransmitters. Um, we, uh, we have the active site that becomes occupied by a molecule that's uh, the isopropyl phosphofluoridate, right? Uh, in any case, that molecule will bind to the active site of acetylcholinesterase permanently forming a covalent bond. And therefore, once again, this enzyme now is useless. It can no longer carry any chemical reaction, right? Well, the substrate will never be able to bind to the active site. So we have inhibitors, but we also have activators. Uh, and so the activators can bind to enzymes and increase their activity that make them more likely to carry out the chemical reaction. Um, and so here we have a nice image, sorry, a nice image of uh, the activator molecule, sorry, the, yeah, the activator molecule, which will change the shape of the enzyme, making it easier for the substrate to bind, right? So that's this one here, the activator molecule. But we could have, even on the same enzyme, we could have another molecule that acts as a, uh, an inhibitor. And in this case, it will also change the shape of the enzyme, but will make it less likely that the substrates can bind, okay? So you can already imagine that the cell, if it's able to control the amount of activators and inhibitors uh, of different enzymes, would have further control over its chemical reactions, right? So for instance, many signaling molecules, such as hormones, would act as activators. And so if you make more hormones, you'll activate more of the enzymes and more of some specific chemical reactions would take place. Let's have a look at uh, just a few examples of interest. Um, one of them involves the molecule fructose 2,6-biphosphate, uh, which is a, a small carbohydrate, right, uh, fructose modified. Uh, in any case, uh, that molecule will act as an activator in a chemical reaction. Uh, well, it, it activates the enzyme PFK1, and uh, that's involved in a chemical reaction that is part of the metabolic pathway or process of glycolysis. Glycolysis is to break down glycogen to the glucose subunits. Right now, it's interesting that this same molecule, right, uh, fructose 2 6 bisphosphate, uh, also acts as an inhibitor of the reverse reaction, but it acts on a different enzyme. Okay, so it, it inhibits a different enzyme, and that different enzyme was carrying the reverse reaction. So it kind of makes sense. Uh, it will both activate the forward reaction and prevent the reverse reaction. So in this case, it prevents gluconeogenesis, which is, this, which is the synthesis of glycogen from glucose. All right, finally, here we have a, another example. Um, now, going back to our metabolic pathways, something that's kind of neat to think about is that sometimes we would like 
a, a chemical pathway to occur until we have accumulated enough of the end product. So let's say we're trying to make isoleucine, that's an amino acid, and we use treonine, uh, which is also another amino acid. And through a series of steps, we're able to produce the molecule isoleucine, but we don't need that much isoleucine. So at, at some point, uh, we would like to slow down or stop that reaction from taking place. Uh, so the higher concentration of isoleucines, uh, of isoleucine, uh, will allow more and more isoleucine molecules to be around. Uh, and isoleucine will act as an inhibitor of one of the steps in that pathway. Okay, so if we have a lot of the end product, we will basically tell that, okay, it's time to stop making that molecule. There's already enough of it. Okay, so by, uh, by regulating um, in this way, so that's called feedback inhibition, we can maintain appropriate levels of several different molecules, right? So hopefully that makes sense. If you need, you can have a look, uh, you know, pause and, and look at it a little further. Uh, but it's a very neat process to ensure that we're never going to make too much of isoleucine. All right, so finally, just a final question uh, to leave you with that. Um, how can cells control their chemical reactions? So we have seen that the cell is a biochemical factory. Inside the cell, there's a a real network of chemical reactions that can take place uh, as long as the enzymes are present and the substrates are present. But the cell uh, and different cells, right, in different uh, organs or tissues uh, of, uh, of the organism would want or would, would need to make different substances so it would have to turn the switch on or off in you know, some parts of that network. Um, by the way, here, the little dots are the, uh, the different uh, molecules that can be made and the lines uh, represent the chemical reactions between them. So if we can have some switches, right, to block or speed up some, uh, some of those parts of that network, then the cell will be able to make the, the products it needs. So, uh, uh, so that's the question, right? How can cells control their chemical reactions? The answers are actually in the presentation we've just had. So, uh, you know, if needed, review this and, and try to make your list. Okay, thank you. That's it for now. See you soon.